Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for that introduction, uh, Maureen. I'm not sure how worried people were when they, when they saw you, not me, but uh, anyway, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here now. Um, the previous speaker at the start of his remarks made the point I think he was a lapsed GP or an ex-GP. Uh, I'm a lapsed several things, but I'm not an a, a lapsed GP. Uh, much, I would say, to the concern of my mother, who spent most of my childhood... My mother was a district nurse or a district midwife, and it was very clear during my... Uh, as I was growing up, uh, that she regarded your profession as the, uh, the target of anybody uh, receiving an education. And uh, I'm not sure our relationship has ever recovered from the fact that I, <laughs> that I, didn't, I didn't go down that route. Um, she had a little bit more success uh, with two of my children, uh, both of whom are training to be doctors. Uh, indeed, I, I uh, attended the wedding of my son about a month ago, and during his remarks, he, uh, he told the, uh, the group that uh, they were very lucky because there was 40 junior doctors at this meeting, or at this, this wedding, and one conservative health minister. Uh, <laughs> and we had five hours of drinks to, uh, to go through. <laughs> So that, that, was a, that, was a, um, that was an enjoyable thing. But I'm going to talk to you uh, in many ways. I'm going to talk to you, though, today um, about the five-year forward view, uh, which many of you will be familiar with. Uh, it, it can be a dry subject. I mean, I, I think another way of looking at it, um, uh, I was reflecting on this, it's about investment and it's about it, innovation, two eyes. We like acronyms, don't we? Um, and maybe another letter as well, uh, because it's very easy to agree with the five-year forward view, and I, I know there's a consensus and, and an enthusiasm for it, but the, the third letter would be A, uh, because it's about action. And if I was you, I would be looking for action. It's been there for six months, uh, and I'm going to try and talk to some of that uh, today. One of the things, and Maureen made the point that I, um, I had been... Uh, I met a minister in July, so I'm still new, uh, so I've got the luxury of talking about uh, what I'm going to do uh, rather than talking about uh, what I have uh, done or, or, or not done. Um, but people very often say to me, what are your initial priorities? What, what are the things that uh, in this portfolio you, portfolio you see as being the most important? And, and, and there's two that I would just draw on today. I, I'm not going to talk about the first one, uh, but it's very clear um, uh, and your profession is at the front end of understanding this, our adult social care system uh, needs to uh, be developed into, I would I'd put it like this, into more sustainable ways of funding it. Um, it, it suffers from the fact that it's, it sits alongside the NHS, uh, which uh, many will believe is underfunded, but it is free at the point of use, uh, and uh, that is not the case of the adult social care system. And I think there's some evidence that we do worse in, than other countries in that regard. But the other area is that of primary uh, care staffing, uh, the, the whole area of primary care staffing. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today, partly through the five-year forward view, the, the two eyes. Um, and and I, I just say this at the start, and, and Maureen mentioned the Public Accounts Committee that we, that we were on, and, and in fact, as I recall, that was about... Uh, workforce planning in the NHS, uh, and, and Maureen was giving evidence to it and, 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 and all the rest of it. But one of the things that's always struck me when we talk about staffing is that we go very quickly to wanting to train more people, uh, to wanting to have more graduates going through university and, uh, and all of the rest of it, and of course that's important. But the other part of staffing, uh, and having enough staff, um, is about retention. And I think we haven't given enough attention to that, uh, that, that's my perspective. And, and I'll say this because I was on the public account committee and I, and I made this remark at that time and, it, and it's in the public domain, um, that it wasn't clear to me who was responsible uh, for retention. And, and I, I, I've been an MP for six years and uh, I worked in various organisations. But if there was issues um, in terms of losing people and people leaving jobs, particularly valued people, uh, leaving jobs, that was a massive issue for most organisations. It was certainly a massive issue for my organisation, and people would lose their jobs if, there was, if that wasn't being addressed enough, and, and, and I want to make progress on that. Um, so those are my, my priorities. My other priority, and one of the things I want to do here today, is, is and, and the slide says it, is to say thank you. Um, your sector of the health economy has been under huge, and is under huge, pressure, 
Um, the figures there stand for, them, uh, uh, stand for themselves. But the two at the bottom, I think, are, are really stand out, and, and the previous speaker talked about this in terms of the respect um, in, in which the medical profession is held. But I don't think any other profession could boast 85% positive experience, 92% trust and confidence. I, I certainly don't think my profession uh, <laughs> uh, could do that. And in fact, it was one of the things, and I, I, since Maureen has started us off on that public accounts committee discussion, that I, as she was talking about morale, and, uh, and I was saying I was trying to understand why it was that, that she felt morale was so difficult. And, and, uh, and one of the things that she mentioned was that a lot of attacks in newspapers and all the, all the go with that. And, and I think I remember saying to her that uh, however many attacks your profession get in newspapers, and, and it does happen from time to time, it's nothing to what we get. Um, and, and it's worth remembering that most of those are written by people who are trying to sell newspapers, not necessarily to inform and engage. Uh, so I, I do want to say thank you. And, and the challenges are not going to get less. Um, large determinant of how much time you need to spend with patients and how much resource that those, those patients require and how much uh, effort is, 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 is driven by age uh, and that demographic is, is, is you know, our, our society is continuing to age uh, and we heard from, again from the last speaker um, one of the things I took from that was that uh, having only one long-term condition was unusual um, and, and that most people have several and, and all the indicators are that that trend also uh, will continue. And we need to, uh, between us, uh, develop a health service that can address that. I'm going to talk now about the five-year uh, forward view, um, or, or, or the two eyes, innovation and investment. Uh, but I want to start off with a very important thing that Simon Stevens, the, the head of the NHS, said at the start of that. Uh, and it just goes to the last couple of slides that I put up. Um, I think if that was voted on across the country, there would be a huge consensus in favour of that. And I think, you know, and that you are under pressure, and, and, and I understand that uh, the difficulties that you face. But remember that at those times, because there is no other profession, I think, that could say that in quite that way. Now, um, Another uh, phrase out of that five-year forward view uh, document, uh, which I hope many of you have, have read, uh, which I thought was a good one, and it was written by a GP, um, made the point that there's a, a myriad of issues coming down the track, uh, and we need a connected approach to address those. And the five-year forward view is an attempt to do that um, in, in terms of a variety of things. Uh, investment, workforce, workload, infrastructure, and care redesign. Uh, investment is the, uh, the word that politicians always use for money, uh, and, I, and, I, and I will talk about that because that matters. Um, before I go into that, I mean, there is a general issue with funding right across the NHS. Um, there's a particular issue, though, I think, in terms of the, the way that's been skewed historically towards uh, primary care. Um, there was, though, a report out, uh, I think it was June this year, from the OECD, looking at the UK and our spending on health and social care, comparing it to the OECD average. We are now above uh, the OECD average. Uh, we're not best in class. Uh, we're in a group of countries, um, including Italy, Austria, Norway, Finland, at around 9.9% of GDP spent on health and social care. Um, that's better than it's been. Uh, there's a set of, if you like, best-in-class countries that are possibly one to one and a half percent higher than that, uh, and that includes France, Germany, uh, and, and, and Sweden. Um, point I'm making, though, is that the gulf is not massive, but however big the gulf is, it's incumbent on all of us to do our best to manage the process better and manage it most effectively. And, and what is certainly the case... Oh, excuse me. It's certainly the case is that the investment and the money that we have been spending uh, in the NHS has not been skewed enough uh, towards primary care. Uh, the five-year forward view is going to put that right. Uh, we've talked about an increase in spending from 9.6 billion to 12 billion by 2020. 
Uh, that's a 14% real increase, and it will take primary care's proportion of total health, spare, uh, health, health care spend back from where it is now at uh, 8% or a little below 8% to a little over 10%. Uh, those are commitments. That is going to happen. Those budgets are set, uh, and uh, you need to hold me and others accountable uh, for, it, for it happening. And part of it as well is around capital, um, because we do need, as part of the tilting of our, of our healthcare service and system uh, towards primary care, we do need to upgrade premises and technology, and there's, there's a budget of 900 million uh, to achieve that. Now, the way that that money is being spent is in a variety of ways, and, and uh, um, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to spend this, uh, this morning talking about that in too much detail. But a big chunk of it is in a sustainability and transformation package, 508 million, uh, focused on workforce, care models, and I'm going to come, come and talk about some of the things I've seen in terms of new care models in a moment, and also helping practices under pressure. The nature of, the nature of any organisation or any, any, any set of businesses is that some are doing better than others, and, it's a question, and we need to make sure we help those that are under pressure. Um, so that, that's a chunk of it. Another focus is on the formula. It, I, I, I uh, don't need to talk to a, to a GP for very long when, when, I, when I meet GPs to have the, the issue of the, uh, the Car Hill formula raised. Uh, we are doing a review of that, uh, the extent to which the, the various points interact, deprivation, age, um, and in, in terms of comparative workload. Plus, there's a load of other things, and people in this room will be aware of university towns, um, Areas with a large non-English uh, speaking population uh, can increase demands and, uh, and workload. And there's also the issue of, of sparsity, which is how spread out uh, some practices are, how rural they are, and how we deal with that. Um, the, that revised contract, we do expect to uh, feed into uh, the revised formula to, to feed into the contract in 2018-19. And there will also be revised guidance around some of the things in terms of universities and uh, uh, sparsity and, and, and non-English speakers. Another area uh, that's been a, an issue, or is an issue, is the whole issue of uh, legal costs and indemnity. Uh, this is an issue right across the NHS. In fact, you could argue that it's an issue right across our country. Uh, but it's an issue that's affected you and your businesses. Uh, and, and we're aware of that. Uh, let me be very clear from my perspective is that I would rather uh, the NHS budget, um, uh, which is tight. I would rather it was spent on doctors, not lawyers. Um, that doesn't mean um, that we can necessarily put an end to it all. Um, there's, there's a whole stack of issues. But I think at a structural level, we do need to be doing more um, as a government in healthcare, but in other areas as well, to make sure that uh, specious claims don't happen um, and that the stresses that it can cause to you and you know, as, a group, as a group doing their best uh, are minimised. I mean, those are the big words. Uh, we've also done some stuff on money that from next year, uh, the inflation element of the increase in indemnity um, will be paid centrally. Um, and uh, this is an area that I personally feel very strongly about. And uh, like I say, I want money spent on doctors. I don't want it spent on lawyers. I thought, thought we'd get agreement on that one. Um, workforce uh, is, the, is the second point there. And, and uh, essentially what the five-year forward view does is, 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 is talks about two initiatives in terms of workforce. Uh, there is a need for more GPs. Um, and we've set ourselves a target of 5,000 and more GPs by 2020. Uh, but there's also a need to, uh, I use an American word, to leverage uh, the profession in terms of more support for GPs. Uh, and uh, we've, we've set ourselves a target of 5,000 additional um, uh, mental health therapists, associate physicians, and... Uh, uh, and, and pharmacists, and I'll, I'll come back to that. In terms of the, um, the first target, the 5,000 extra GPs, uh, that's a tough target, and we are trying very hard to make it. We're, we're recruiting 3,250 per annum into GP training. Um, 
We're trying very hard, and I know the Royal College has produced a video um, in terms of uh, convincing medical students that this is a central career, and, and indeed, this is, the, this is the growth path of our NHS. Um, when, I, when, I, when I took this job and uh, was given this job, I remember I met Jeremy Hunt, and, and he just said, well, you're doing primary care. You know that's the future, don't you? And, and he said it in a, in a flippant way, but of course it was true, and it is true. And, and medical students um, need to understand that as well um, in, in terms of how they make their choices um, and, and all that go with that. And we've introduced bursaries to uh, try to get people to go to areas that are less attractive, uh, apparently less attractive to, to work in than others. Um, and, and there's 20,000 pounds available for that. Uh, and we've also announced uh, earlier uh, this week um, that we would be putting more UK people through medical college and medical school. Um, and that's not because we don't value uh, foreign doctors and the fantastic contribution that foreign doctors have made and will continue to make. It's, it's not because of that at all. It's because our population is increasing. And it's right that if we've got a cohort of students, very often uh, with so straight A's all the way through, who find that at the end of all of that they don't get into medical school, it's very hard to say to them that that's, uh, you know, why that is apparently government policy. Uh, so we, it, I think it's right that we do as much as we can. I, I met a, a boy recently in Warrington who had just failed to get into medical school. He'd gone through the process. Uh, and, and, he, and he said, do I have any advice for him? And that's a very hard question to answer. Um, but, you know, he was solid a student right the way through. And uh, it doesn't seem right that if we've got people like that who are determined, have got an ambition to come into, into your profession, um, that, that we don't do what we can uh, to help them. Uh, but it's equally true, though, that if we are going to make progress towards that 5,000 number, we do need to do better than we've done in the last few years on retention. And that's a complex issue, and it's around morale, and it's around many things like that. Um, one of the things, actually, I had a meeting with uh, Maureen and, and Helen uh, earlier this week, and, and they made what struck me as being an extremely good point, that as doctors come towards the end of their careers, in, into their maybe late 50s, 60s, late 60s, many want to work part-time, and it's harder than it ought to be. And my reaction was that it struck me that the profession of being a GP sort of lends itself in many ways to working part-time because you can just decide how many patients that, that, you, uh, that you want to see. And, uh, and they made some points about why it wasn't easy. And, and it seems to me that there's things on that that we can make progress on which really are not rocket science and just need to happen. Uh, and I look forward to working with them uh, to do that. An announcement that was made this week um, in terms of uh, a progress was the changes to the induction and refresher uh, mechanism, a further investment in that. Again, uh, not an, you, know, you wouldn't have thought this was a sort of massively complex thing to make it easier for people that are qualified, that have maybe you know, uh, had a career break, uh, left the profession for a while, make it easier for them to come back. Uh, and we're hoping that something like 500 uh, of our target of uh, 5,000 uh, will be met by uh, uh, by achieving that and uh, in, in some ways I was, I was reflecting on the announcement and the press release that we made and, and, and in some ways it's interesting that something as sensible as uh, making that process, that INR process, um, more accessible and more straightforward required a press release because uh, I can't help thinking that that isn't really the way that we want to be uh, uh, managing the NHS. Um, the other thing that we want to do is um, make it easier to get onto the back onto the performers list, um, sometimes without going through the INR uh, process for, for qualified people. There must be things there uh, that we can do to help. In terms of leverage, I, 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 uh, I, uh, or, or the second 5,000, um, just make the point again, by 2020, we will have a further 3,000 mental health therapists, a further 1,000 physician associates, more medical assistants, and more practice nurses in place. Uh, in addition to that, an important part of it is the role that the uh, pharmacy profession can also play uh, to support 
uh, to support the GP and primary care teams. Um, and there's, there's two roles, really. There's one as part of those teams, and we're intending to hire 1,500 pharmacists into GP practices by 2020. And we've allocated £30 million to do that. Uh, the target that we've set is that we would have a pharmacy ratio across the population of at least one pharmacist uh, for every 30,000 uh, population actually embedded, working under the control of the GP practices. And, and, I, and I think that just has to be directionally right. In addition to that, we need to work better with the pharmacy, um, the independent pharmacists, um, who can offer and do offer an awful lot in terms of services which could leverage GP activities um, and in terms of long-term conditions and minor ailments. There's a review going on um, by um, David Murray of the King's Fund looking at ways that we can actually utilise the pharmacists better and more around services as well as the dispensing role that they have now because that has to be the future uh, for that profession. And we're intending to allocate £100 million in uh, integration of that uh, between now and uh, uh, 2020. There's a massive role that, that, that the pharmacy profession can play in, uh, in primary care. Third item on there is workload. Um, I'm not going to say a great deal about this other than to say there's a set of sensible things that can be done. One of them uh, is around streamlining the CQC process such that good and outstanding practices can, can go between up to five years uh, in future uh, without a CQC uh, um, investigation. Um, we can streamline the payment system. Uh, generally, there's, there's thought to be possibly as many as a quarter of GP appointments that are avoidable. Uh, some of the things I've talked about in terms of leverage might be able to help with that. Better use of pharmacists uh, for a start, um, but there's, there's no doubt that the whole area of red tape and bureaucracy doesn't help you, and uh, I, I think the previous speaker talked about the need to read uh, two papers a night um, to uh, only be uh, uh, 500 years behind, was it? Uh, well, I would rather that you were reading two papers a night um, than grappling with cumbersome red tape and uh, payment systems that don't work properly. On infrastructure, uh, as I said earlier, there's £900 million available for that. Um, this is part of the innovation, if you like, the second eye uh, that, I, that I talked about at the start. It's about buildings, um, and you know, it, it's, it's absolutely appropriate um, that we continue to focus on upgrading the primary he uh, uh, healthcare uh, suite of buildings. I, I've opened two medical centres in the last uh, month, uh, one in Warrington uh, and one in uh, Alderley Edge. Uh, so, but I'm assuming, I need these are fantastic facilities and, and I don't know if either Dr Kumar or Dr Thompson or any of their teams are here today. But when you go around those things, I think I use the phrase, it's almost worth being ill to come into them because they are just absolutely fantastic. And when I look back on the sorts of facilities that I used to visit, uh, <laughs> with my mum, perhaps, as part of her campaign to get me to be a GP. But, I mean, you know, very often it was the back room of a doctor's house and all the rest of it. And that really isn't adequate. Uh, NHS England are now in a position to pay 100% of these costs. Of course, there's a process to go through, but we need to make progress. But it's also about technology. Um, one of the um, things that I remember from a visit to Morecambe Bay, I think very early in my, uh, uh, in, in my tenure, was the use they were making of... of uh, I'm not going to call these the right things now, but cameras that enable consultations to take place um, over many tens of miles. And in, in that case, it was particularly applicable because of the distance. People could drive two hours uh, or an hour to the nearest town in you know, Cumbria. And uh, you know, that's a very poor use of uh, doctor time. And it's a very poor use of patient time, to be honest. And uh, the way that that was being done, and including hospital consultations and breaking down the barrier between the acute sector and the primary sector, I thought was powerful. Um, so, I mean, that whole area of infrastructure is something that we do need to, uh, to pay attention to. And, and the final area is that of care redesign. Um, I think the next topic after me as I looked at the agenda, I may have got this wrong, was uh, 
do, do new care models ruin the essence of being a GP or something? So I, I need to be careful what I say about this. But th the new care models that I've seen um, struck me as doing completely the opposite, as, as putting the GP in the driving seat in many cases of the MCPs of multidisciplinary care models, straddling social care, uh, straddling mental health, community, net, community health, and having that much more integrated uh, than it's been uh, historically. Um, there's something like 50 vanguards going on across the country at the moment, covering around about 7% of the population. As I say, a number of those are primary care-led, uh, some are acute care-led, but they've all got a, got a intention of better integration right across the, uh, the care sector. Um, and I, I can recall um, attending a meeting in, I think it was in Dudley, uh, in which the GP was leading a meeting of several disciplines, including social workers and mental health, in which they were going down the list of high, high risk patients and, and, and deciding proactively what they might do in advance, potentially, of a consultation. Um, and, and of course, the, one of the byproducts of being able to do this better is lower emergency hospital admissions uh, and, and better hospital uh, discharges. Uh, and of course, if we do both of those things, it does save money. But we need to do it because principally, uh, if we can do it better, it provides better care. And, and uh, that really is the objectives. The transformation areas is a way of moving that into um, the population more, more generally. Uh, and, and I'll talk a little bit about the SDP process as well, which was kicked off in December um, last year. And during the course of this month, the, the, there's 44 uh, project uh, areas. Um, people will be submitting to NHS England uh, for, if you like, review and, and sign off uh, their plans. Um, essentially, they're a place-based way of looking at how we're going to provide care over the next uh, five years. Um, they're trying to focus on long-term conditions, cancer, mental health, and as I say, much better integration between health and social care. The one that I know best is the one that's happening in, the, uh, in my own home, Pats. There is, a, there is a primary care strand to that. There's a mid and back office care strand, and, and there's an acute strand. Um, but I understand, and I've spoken to Maureen about her concern, that in too many cases, she doesn't feel that GPs are being adequately consulted. Um, hard for me to answer that. Some of them, some of these STPs, uh, something like eight, I think, are being led by CCGs. I, I do also understand that doesn't mean the GPs are always adequately consulted in, in those cases. Um, Maureen has put into place, or, or you, you, your professional has put into place, these uh, GP ambassadors uh, providing input to the STPs. And I'm very, very keen, in fact, um, determined that that will be taken very seriously and that that will happen. And, you know, there, there is concern because everybody is concerned in life about change. And, and I, I, I've said on a number of occasions, uh, it's much harder to manage change and to deliver change than to manage steady state. And, and I actually don't think that the, uh, actually the civil service, perhaps, or, or, or many parts of the, of the world understand that and the real difficulty in change because change destabilizes and it can make things uh, appear... Um, as though they're a threat, when actually it ought to be sensible things for which there's a consensus around. But I will say this, that we're expecting, as the SDPs come forward, there to be a variety of degrees of completeness, a variety of um, SDPs in terms of having the ability to, to move forward quickly, and, and in some cases perhaps not to be able to move forward. We won't move forward uh, with SDPs if they're not right. Uh, and frankly, it would be hard for me to say that if there was a consensus in an area amongst the GPs, that an SDP was not right, that it would be in a position to move forward. Uh, but I perhaps have said enough about that now. Um, so the theme of really what I've talked about is, is investment and innovation. Uh, we need to keep open minds about the improvements that we have to make to the NHS. Uh, investment and innovation. But it's also about action. I've talked about the indemnity scheme, the INR scheme. Um, but there's always challenges, I think... Uh, I very proudly have talked to you about 5,000 more GPs by 2020 and 5,000 more uh, support staff as well, so 10,000 more in, in, into your, 
your profession, but I think there was a press release from Pulse yesterday saying they should have 12,000. I haven't seen the, uh, the detail of that, uh, but I'll look at that with interest uh, because there's always more to do and maybe it's right that they challenge us um, and, and that we understand uh, why they believe that. Um, I also um, do think that words are cheap and all I've given you today has been words uh, and what you need to hold me and the government accountable for is action on the five-year forward view. It's a, there's, a, there's a clear intent to deliver it and to do it um, and I will be working uh, very hard to do it. I know that if I, if I don't, Maureen and Helen and others will, will hold me to account. Uh, maybe even my mother will. Um, thank you very much indeed for listening.